The stories of Conan the Barbarian, written by Robert E. Howard between 1931 and 1936, told the tales of a hulking barbarian who travelled the lands fighting evil, rescuing princesses, and generally just being an affront to civilization. It's no exaggeration to say that Howard's stories practically gave birth to the entire sword and sorcery genre of fiction as we know it today. Many people may know the character from the 1982 film Conan the Barbarian and the 1984 sequel Conan the Destroyer, both starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. The release of these films made Conan popular with a new generation, leading to the development of tabletop role-playing games, so many of them, board games, comics, and of particular interest to us, video games. How has Conan been brought to life in games over the years? Do these games live up to the legend of the Barbarian himself? Let's don our loincloths, Atlantean blades, and take a look for ourselves. It's a video game Odyssey 4, Conan the Barbarian. Robert E. Howard was a writer who was influenced by both the works of classic poetry and also the tall tales told by the people of rural Texas, where he grew up and lived. He also had a scathing dislike of civilization, in particular, the Texas oil boom which had occurred during his lifetime, which he had saw as corrupting people through greed, and oil companies breaking down local communities by occupying them to strip them of all their resources. Howard also participated in local boxing matches, which gave him a very personal experience of combat and violence. Combining this loathing of civilization and hands-on experience of violence, Howard created Conan the Barbarian, a dark-haired, muscular man who wandered the world, rejecting the false idols of society and fighting for no one but himself. Howard's writing cleverly combines his influences of poetry and classical literature with the local Texan stories and harsh experiences of reality to create a character in Conan that was both violent and unchained by civilized rules, but also held to his own beliefs, often sacrificing wealth and personal gain to save people. Again, contrasting Conan with the greed of what he saw in modern civilization. Conan's adventures are set in the Age of Hyboria, a time described as between the fall of Atlantis and the rise of any known ancient civilization. This imaginary age allowed Howard to be creative with his setting and also meant he didn't need to research the ancient history that he would have needed to, as the required books and research material were scarcely available in rural Texas. The result is an age filled with ancient civilizations, which are familiar yet distinct, combining sword fighting with more fantastical tales of magic and ancient wizards. As mentioned, this setting would practically invent the genre of sword and sorcery fiction, and franchises such as Dungeons and Dragons may not even exist without Howard's work. Interestingly, Howard also had a significant correspondence with H.P. Lovecraft which began when Howard wrote a letter to the fiction magazine Weird Tales, in which Lovecraft's and Howard's stories were printed. While the two were good friends, Lovecraft considered civilization to be the peak of humanity, while Howard saw it as bringing out the worst in people. Howard even contributed to the Cthulhu mythos with a number of short stories, although sadly, we never see Conan fight the Eldritch God, which would have been a crossover for the ages. The stories of Conan maintained a popularity after Howard's tragic suicide in 1936, being reprinted numerous times. In 1982, a new generation was introduced to the character, with the film Conan the Barbarian, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger as the titular hero. A solid film thanks to the brutal combat and fighting, expansive locations, and epic soundtrack that gave birth to an expanded franchise. The 1984 sequel, Conan the Destroyer, continues the saga of the first, but is very much toned down in terms of its violence and high fantasy, going with a bit more of a humorous and slapstick approach that overwhelmingly smells of studio interference wanting to secure a PG rating for the film. All I can say about the 2011 film starring Jason Momoa is… not great. The sheer number of comics, board games, tabletop role-playing games, TV series that were birthed following Conan's researches in the 80s is immense. But more importantly, it's where our look at the video games of Conan begin, which is what we're interested in. In 1984, coinciding with the release of Conan the Destroyer, we have our first video game, Conan Hall of Volta, released on the Apple II computer and ported to the Commodore 64 and Atari 800 systems. In this platforming game, you control Conan as he seeks to stop the evil wizard Volta, 
a story which bears no relation to the film of the same year. You will have to jump across platforms, defeat enemies, and collect gems and keys to progress through the game's seven levels. This game was apparently not meant to be a Conan game at all, but was a game called Visigoth, as evidenced in some early development screenshots, which also explains why Conan in the release game uses a limited number of swords that are thrown and returned to you, as the original game had boomerangs instead of swords. The game starts off fairly simply, but gets challenging fairly quickly, and requires some complex puzzle solving later on. In level 6, you have to bring down a chandelier onto a machine before you can proceed, which you do by killing enemies until our ladder falls down until you can reach it. I also got a lot of lag on this level on all three versions, which makes getting through it very frustrating. Level 7, the final level, consists of an absurdly convoluted puzzle, which I'm not sure how you would figure out. You have to dodge the enemies, pits, and magic attacks sent at you by Volta, meanwhile some of the magic attacks can be attacked themselves to turn into gems, three of which you have to place below Volta to beat him. However, it is extremely difficult to tell the difference between which attacks you can attack and turn into gems, and which you can't, as they are almost identical. The ones you can attack flash a little bit differently, but it will take some time for you to recognise it. But how you would work that out I have no idea. The worst thing about the final level is if you run out of swords, you will have to drop down the middle, back to level 6, and complete the level again to collect some more, so it's best to stock up while you're down there. When you finally get all the gems in the final level, you free your bird friend thing. It picks up Volta, drops him in the lava, and carries Conan off to his next adventure. All in all, it's not a bad game for the time, as the platforming is fun and there's a variety to the levels, but the difficulty does ramp up fairly quickly to make everything a little frustrating. You also only have three lives from the start to beat the game, and as you die in one hit, beating this game will take some skill, and very few mistakes. The Commodore 64 and Atari 800 versions are similar to the Apple II version, save for the slightly different colour palettes and sound capabilities of each system. I would say the Apple II version is probably the definitive version to play, if only because the lava is actually red and not purple or yellow. Next, we have Conan Mysteries of Time for the NES, released in 1990. In this one, Conan is seeking the throne of Aquilonia, and to do so, he must gather the four urns of Aquilonia's early kings and return them to the tomb of Kalhalla. The game is a side-scrolling platformer that requires you to not only platform your way through the levels, but to hunt down items and weapons which you will need to progress the game. If the game looks familiar, then that may be because this game is actually a port of the game Myth, History in the Making for the ZX Spectrum and other consoles. The NES version inexplicably just turned it into a Conan game. In Myth, you travel through various periods of ancient human history, and this element fits Conan fairly well, as a lot of the locations in the Hyborian Mythos are similar to ancient civilizations, such as the Greeks, Vikings, and Egyptians. However, if you want to play this game, you are better sticking to any of the Myth versions and avoiding the NES one, because this is bad. Really bad. In fact, it ranks as one of the worst released NES games, and for good reason. The platforming is awkward, and the controls are nonsensical. Case in point, you have to press down to jump. Down. Who thought this was a good idea? The difficulty is brutal as well, filling the screen with constantly respawning enemies that impede any progress. The start of the game is probably where you'll get stuck quite a bit, as you start with no items and must find a weapon and other necessary items just to exit the cave you're in. But all that is easily thwarted by the mass of enemies and awkward jumping that can send you easily falling into the lava pits. The game also only gives you free lives for the entire game, which is particularly cruel. Once out of the caves, you will need to go through the game's other levels, being careful to find the necessary items you need. If you miss them, you're basically finished. The instruction manual does, in its backstory, tell you what you need to do in the levels and what items you need but doesn't point out the locations, so there's still a lot you'll need to work out to get through it all. Hey, nobody said becoming a king was easy. Probably the cruelest part of the difficulty is the final level in an Egyptian, I mean, Zambulan tomb. 
in which you must find the four urns and place them in a specific order at the end of the level. The problem is, you'll probably have no idea what that order is, so if you do it incorrectly, you die instantly. And since you only have three lives from the start of the game as mentioned, you have very few chances, if any, to get this right. If somehow you do it right and defeat the final boss, you are rewarded with a single image at the end of the game. Conan the King. Well, good for him. If you want to play this game, you are better off sticking to the myth versions as mentioned. Even though they were released first on typically less powerful consoles, they look and play a lot better, as the NES version barely has any detail in the backgrounds and cuts some levels as well. So yes, definitely not Conan's best adventure. Conan the Sumerian was released in 1991 for MS-DOS and Amiga, and was followed by another MS version, Conan the Sumerian Enhanced Edition. This game is a classic mix of top-down adventuring, point and clicking, and dungeon crawling. In the opening sequence, we see Conan and his wife leading a peaceful existence in a village, until one day, an army on horseback ride through the village, killing Conan's wife and everyone else apart from the barbarian himself. Conan learns that the army is led by the evil wizard Thothamon, and sets off to destroy him and his army. You arrive in the shady city of Shadazar, which acts as the major hub of the game, where you'll be talking to people, accepting quests, and exploring houses and hidden passages. You start with nothing but a sword and 20 coins, which gets you almost nothing. And before you can make any progress in the game, you'll need to get some money, and, being a barbarian, you can quite happily loot people's houses to do so, as the game's manual implores you to. The first thing you'll need to do is go to the Swordmaster and learn two of the game's fighting styles, as you start with just the one, and different styles will be effective against different enemies. The trouble is these cost 150 coins each, and as mentioned you only start with 20, meaning you'll be doing a lot of stealing gems and other items to pawn, as well as buying different keys to get into more houses to pillage. You can also get side quests to get extremely valuable items, such as amulets that reflect magic and the like. You can turn these quests in to receive a sizeable amount of gold, or keep the items for yourself, which is by far the better option. You may have to use teleport spells to reach parts of the map you can't by foot, but you'll also need one to get back, otherwise you'll be stuck. So preparation is key. As mentioned, you'll really need to prepare yourself before you undertake the main quest of the game, split into seven separate episodes in which you must travel through dungeons and across the land to get to Fothamon and stop him. It is a very slow start to the game, but once you've kitted Conan out with what he needs, you can start making sizeable progress. Nevertheless, the game always retains a certain amount of difficulty. The dungeons you often have to navigate are long, and it is very easy to get lost in them, almost requiring you to map them by hand. The enemies also respawn every time you enter and exit, meaning you have to fight your way through them again and again. The main issue with this is that Conan has limited health, and it regenerates very slowly, about 5 points every 5 minutes from what I can tell, and you can only regenerate health otherwise by staying at an inn, which means travelling back to Shadazar and spending your precious gold, or using a potion, which is even more expensive, and takes up precious space in your inventory. The game's combat is probably the weakest aspect of the game, which is essentially consisting of choosing your fighting style and holding the up button until you or your enemy die. That's it. Some enemies will require special items or weapons to defeat them, or you must find another way to stop them, such as the invincible iron golem. However, I think on the whole the game is pretty good, with plenty to explore and secrets to find, and a story that flows nicely, although as mentioned it will take a while to get the necessary equipment to get going. Overcoming situations such as the Iron Golem can take some working out, but when you die, you see the narrator who is telling Conan's story saying he misspoke, and offering a hint about what Conan actually did to get out of the situation, which is nice. The original MS-DOS version has all the content of the game, but is limited rather graphically. The Amiga version improves the graphics and colours, but the gameplay is the same as the DOS version. In the Amiga version, after the title screen, it instructs you to insert the square medallion to continue. It took me a while to realise that the square medallion would have been a floppy disk, and the game is asking you to change discs, which is a pretty funny way of saying it, 
Also, the Amiga version is the only version where I could get gold from defeating random enemies on the map. But this was rare, and provided very little gold, meaning it was not worth wasting time trying to earn money this way. Conan the Sumerian Enhanced Edition was released later, only on DOS, which had the graphics of the Amiga version, along with a bit more detail in some of the areas such as in Shadazar. The most notable improvement in the Enhanced Edition is the inclusion of voice acting, and while it's not particularly great voice acting, as you would expect in a 1991 game, it does add a little bit of extra depth. You cannot escape me. You cannot defeat me. Your feeble protection against my powers will not last long. Overall, this is definitely the version of the game you will want to be playing, and if you are into these types of games, it's a pretty good one to try if you don't mind the slow start. The next game in the franchise didn't turn up until 2004, where Conan, sometimes called Conan the Dark Axe, was released on PlayStation 2, Nintendo GameCube, Xbox and PC. In this action-adventure game, Conan's home village of Granach is burned to the ground by soldiers belonging to the group known only as the Cult of the Vulture. In typical Conan style, he heads off to get some revenge and wipe them out. Along the way, Conan encounters many of the familiar characters and settings of the Hyborian Age, as you hack, slash, and solve puzzles across the levels. There's also some town stages where you can explore and talk to people, helping you learn more about the world. There's a good mix of platforming, puzzle solving, and of course, combat, including huge bosses as you explore the varied stages, from the snowy mountains, cult temples, deep jungle, and endless deserts. It very much feels like what you would expect a Conan game to be. However, there's not really much that makes it a very standout game, nor is there anything too memorable about the experience. The combat system works competently for the most part, but definitely hasn't aged too well, and the controls are very stiff. The points you earn from defeating enemies go into purchasing new moves that help you in your quest, which gives a bit of variety to the combat. You can also get different weapons to use, including perhaps the greatest weapon ever, the Sword Axe. When you die, you are sent to the realm of Krom, the god Conan worships, who tests Conan against some more enemies. If you win, you can return to where you were, but if you lose, it's game over. This only happens if you die in combat though, as Krom will only deem you worthy if you die a warrior's death, rather than just falling down a pit for example. There's also a multiplayer mode in which you and a friend can choose one of 16 characters and fight one another, or take on a survival or score attack mode, but these just feel like tacked on modes which don't really have much going for them. The difference between the versions is mostly graphics based, with each version limited by the system it is played on. The PC version is definitely the best looking, but I had some issues getting the controls to work properly. One strange difference I noticed is that on the PC version, you can guard against the ghost's magic attacks on the tribal hideaway level, whereas on the console versions, they are unblockable. This is especially annoying, as these attacks will knock you down, and can knock you down again before you can easily recover, trapping you in a loop. The only other difference that I found is that you can save anywhere on the PC version, and in the console version you can save anywhere using the sacred stones you can pick up through the level. You can only have four sacred stones at a time though, so you must choose when to use them. There's plenty through the levels though, so you don't have to save too sparingly. The PC version does retain this save system, alongside also being able to quick save anywhere, so I don't know what the point of them is here. In short, Conan is a decently playable game for the time, although it does show its age now. There's a good amount of variety, but the controls ultimately let it down. This is where things get a little confusing, in 2007, three years after Conan, another game was released, also called Conan, for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. The two games are completely unrelated and made by different developers, so with only three years difference, it can be easy to confuse the two. In this game, Conan is exploring some ruins when he inadvertently releases an evil magician, Graven, from his magical prison. Conan awakens and must put a stop to Graven and the black death he is spreading, which is turning men into savage monsters. 
Teaming up with a pirate named Akana, you'll again fight as Conan through locations in Conan lore, such as the Barakan Isles and Stygia, as you seek to reclaim your armor that Graven has infused with evil magic and put a stop to the evil sorcerer once and for all. The game is very similar to the 2004 one, but also clearly takes inspiration from action games of the time, such as God of War. Strangely enough, the combat system is quite similar to the previous Conan games, with you using the points you get from defeating enemies to acquire new abilities and combos. There is a huge variety of moves to use in the game, as well as using either a sword and shield, two swords, or a two-handed weapon, each with different movesets. Despite all of this, the combat does feel very clunky and overly complicated. Most enemies that aren't the standard smaller ones will block nearly every attack and will instantly counterattack with long combos that will keep you stun locked, and this can happen repeatedly, which is very cheap and frustrating. The game also has a fixed camera angle, opting to use the right control stick to roll in whichever direction it is pushed in. This can lead to the game feeling very linear and being able to miss things since you can't survey the area properly. The game focuses heavily on the gore too, with moves that will dismember your opponents in various ways, as well as barely clothed maidens that you can often rescue, which gives you an idea of the mature audience the game is aimed at. At a single glance, you can probably tell this is from the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era. The washed out colour scheme of green, brown and a slightly different shade of brown are so dully iconic of the time that it fails to stand out now as much as it did then. The developers focused on developing a painterly style for their locations, making them look like they've been created with oil paints and classic brush strokes. But this is very much lost amidst the washed out colour scheme. Like the Conan game released three years prior, Conan 2007 sits as very much an average action adventure game, without too much to make it memorable. Some effort is required to get to grips with the combat system, but even then, you're always prone to being stunlocked to death by the enemy's cheap combos, which leaves a lasting impression of frustration through no fault of your own. In 2008, after a number of delays, the MMORPG Age of Conan Hyborian Adventures was released on PC. As you might expect from the genre, the game provides a huge open world to fight, quest and explore, as the Hyborian Age provides a sufficient body of lore to do so. After you create your own custom character, you are introduced to the main quest line for the game, as you begin as a slave on a slave ship, when a storm destroys the ship and casts you overboard, causing the soul of the demon that kept you enslaved to flee your body. Miraculously, you survive and wake up on the Barakan Isles, known as a refuge of pirates and general villainy, as you begin your quest to regain your lost memories and defeat the forces that enslaved you. Along the way, you will encounter characters familiar to the franchise, including Kalenthes, who aids you at important milestones in your quest, Valeria, who you work with to liberate the city of Tortage on the Barakan Isles, and Conan himself, who is currently the King of Aquilonia, as he is in the later stories. After you reach level 20 and liberate Tortage, you will be able to enter the lands of Hyboria proper, travelling across Samaria, Aquilonia and Stygia, continuing your quest as you seek out four pieces of an ancient amulet to awaken an ancient Atlantean god in order to combat the man who enslaved you, the evil Thothamon. In 2010, an expansion pack, Rise of the Godslayer, was released that added in a new region, the land of Katai, and a whole host of new quests based there. As you go towards the level 80 cap, you will be able to unlock new main game quests and continue the story, and unlock more of your memories, making you more and more powerful. Meanwhile, to level up, there are plenty of quests in plenty of different locations to keep you busy. Combat uses a real combat system that has you aiming attacks in different directions and inputting combos consisting of these directional attacks. In 2011, the game rebranded as Age of Conan Unchained by making the game free to play, with extra content and items being made available for subscribers and those who purchased in-game currency. Playing in 2023 as I did, the game is certainly not as populated as it used to be, as it was a very popular game when it came out. But there are still a fair amount of people playing the game, so you can get help with quests and dungeons that require a group fairly simply, or you can fight world bosses and raids on a larger scale, which is pretty fun too. All in all, you've got 15 plus years of content to indulge yourself in, and though the grind to get to level 80 can be a long one, particularly at the end, to unlock the raids and the end game content, there's plenty to do and see in the way that you want to, and it still remains a pretty solid MMO by the standards of the genre, backed of course by the rich lore of the franchise. 
In 2011, the reboot film Conan the Barbarian starring Jason Momoa was released, which I can only describe as a bit dull. Alongside this, the game Conan Tower of the Elephant was released in the same year for Apple iOS operating systems. The game follows the story of the original Conan story Tower of the Elephant, which has Conan arriving in the city of Aranjun and learning of a gem called the Heart of the Elephant, kept by the sorcerer Yara in his tower. You, as Conan, will be exploring the city of Aranjun, fulfilling quests to get you closer and closer to your goal of stealing the heart of the elephant. Using the game's touch controls to move Conan around and attack with your sword is a bit clunky, as you would expect from a 2011 mobile game. But fortunately, the game doesn't require anything too precise in terms of controls and combat. The story itself is told through the game's quests, but also through some comic book style cutscenes, which are a nice touch. Ultimately though, the game is very bare bones and janky, and if you want to experience the story of the Tower of the Elephant, which is one of the most notable Conan stories, you're better off reading the short story itself, as the gameplay element really doesn't add much. The next entry comes from 2017 in the form of Conan Exiles, an open world survival game. The game has similarities, a lot of similarities, to the game Rust in that you must gather, manage your resources, and build shelters and items to survive in a hostile world. Unlike Rust, however, Conan Exiles does provide a loose story in the form of a single-player campaign. At the start of the game, you create your character, including which god they worship, to give you your special ability, and you find yourself pinned to a cross in the middle of a desert. None other than Conan the Barbarian himself comes to rescue you from the cross. But you are unable to leave the exiled lands you find yourself in, thanks to a bracelet that has been placed on your wrist that will kill you if you try to remove it or venture beyond the barrier surrounding the exiled lands. Your only hope is to survive in this land, gather resources, construct powerful weapons, and learn the fate that awaits you and the other exiles that populate this land. You can choose to play this game however you want, in multiplayer servers, working together, fighting one another in PvP servers, or just building whatever you want with unlimited resources in creative mode. Another unique element to this game is the Thrall system, which allows you to knock out NPCs and put them in the Wheel of Pain to convert them into your allies, or slaves, allowing you to journey with different kinds of fighters with a range of abilities. If you're playing the single player story, you'll want to travel to the ancient city where the race known as the Giant Kings once ruled the land. A lone survivor tells you that in the past, humans came to this land for refuge, which the Giant Kings granted, but eventually humans being humans declared war against them. In response to this, the Giant Kings created the bracelets to enslave human prisoners and get them to do their bidding. Now, it seems another evil force is using the bracelet to keep humans trapped within the exiled lands, and the only way to remove the bracelet is to gather the seven ancient artifacts used to create the bracelets and combine them to undo their magic. You must travel the different parts of the exiled lands to reclaim the artifacts and free yourself from the bracelet's power. The trouble with the story is that it feels very rough and unfinished. The only clues you really get are vague clues from the archivist in the Lost City and from a rather mouthy staff who doesn't guide you very far. You can go and visit other NPCs, including Conan himself, who is hanging out in a tavern, but there's still not much to go on. If you do manage to combine the seven items, well, actually it's six, since you don't need the Serpent Ring of Set for some reason, you can undo the bracelet's curse at any time and escape. Doing this, however, will permanently delete your character, as the ending cutscene shows them walking away over the horizon beyond their discarded bracelet so you have to decide if you want to remain or leave. At its default settings, playing single player is a long and laborious process. Getting powerful enough armor and weapons to take on the bosses would require hours of grinding resources and getting decent thralls to aid you, which would be essential. Fortunately, you can customize the game to your liking, making yourself as strong or as weak as you'd like, enabling creative mode to spawn whatever resources you like, or just making yourself plain invincible. Obviously, playing the game in single player doesn't give you the most out of this game, but the world is huge and you could easily lose hours just exploring it, building whatever you want, and choosing from a load of different items to populate your dwelling. The game is still being updated in 2023 too, so there's still content that is keeping it fresh. 
Conan Exiles is a game that you're going to have the most fun with playing with your friends in whatever way you want to, and while the single player is a bit sparse in terms of story, there's a fair amount of lore and a large world for you to explore, but overall it's not a leader in the open world survival genre. In 2019, Conan Unconquered was released on PC. It is the first and only real-time strategy game in the franchise, as you must typically build your army, manage your buildings and your resources in order to defeat your enemies. You won't be fighting opponents like yourself, who are building their own bases, but rather waves of enemies that come for your base as you fight them off one by one. The game is much more of a horde-style survival game, as you face off individual waves while improving your base and army. There's no real story or campaign in the game, just a few scenarios that introduce you to some of the game's different units and features, and you can create your own custom games of various difficulty. There is, however, a comic that unlocks through playing the scenarios, which gives a bit more detail into what is going on. Regarding the difficulty, you can pick up the basics of the game fairly quickly, but actually surviving the game is hard. You really have to learn how to manage your resources efficiently, as generating gold to maintain your army is expensive, so you'll want to choose your units carefully and level them up to veteran status, rather than focusing on pure numbers. Even on easy difficulty, you can be easily overwhelmed if you haven't properly prepared. Between waves, you can explore the map and defeat creatures and hunt out resources, but make sure your units are back at base, ready for the next wave. The waves themselves can easily consist of 100 enemies or more, and come from multiple directions, so the placement of your units and your defences is also key to your survival. Alongside the single player scenarios, you can also play co-op with a friend and take on the enemy waves together or create your own custom map. My criticism of the game is that there aren't a lot of units to choose from to build your army, and that feeds into the larger issue that there isn't that many ways to play the game. You have to build certain things at certain times to stand a chance. Overall, Conan Unconquered, while lacking in content, is a fun little game to play, but it's easy to be quickly overwhelmed if you don't take the time to manage your resources and plan your building effectively. While easy to casually pick up, to master it requires some dedication. The most recent game in the franchise is Conan Chop Chop, released in 2021 for PC, Xbox One, PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch. Another genre first for the franchise, this one is a roguelike action game. Thothamon has resurrected the evil creature Zaltatun, but he cannot complete the ritual since he only has half of the Heart of Ahriman required to complete the ritual. To complete Zaltatun's revival, it needs a strong body to possess, and in order to find one, Thothamon organises a contest for warriors to pass his four trials and to receive the grand prize of being Zaltatun's vessel, but obviously he doesn't mention that. You have the choice of playing as one of four characters, all of whom are from the original Conan stories, Conan himself, Valeria, Bellet, and Palentides. You can also play in co-op with up to four people playing the different characters. Your aim is to travel through each of the four areas, going through the dungeons and defeating the bosses, before finally confronting Thothamon and Zaltatun themselves. In order to get the true ending of the game, you will have to fulfil a side quest of exchanging items in each of the four worlds before you reach the final boss. Otherwise, Thothamon will send you back in time to do them all over again. Being a roguelike game, upon death you will lose all your items and gold, but will gain experience based on your performance, so you can permanently level up and unlock new skills which will help you progress. You will also keep all the steel fire you pick up, which can be used to permanently unlock equipment that you can use on your next runs. The game has a more light-hearted feel through the cutscenes and also the cartoony graphics. There's still a decent amount of depth in the different equipment and builds you can make, but the fact that the equipment you can choose at the start of each run is randomised makes it difficult to get the right equipment necessary to make decent builds. While you obviously accept a certain amount of randomness in these kind of games, it seems like you need certain essential items and upgrades to show up to get very far. The enemies also take quite a few hits to defeat, no matter how many upgrades you get, so it often feels like you're not making much progress or getting more powerful, alongside making the game feel like it's little more than a constant button mashing fest. It's a more casual game in terms of looks and gameplay, but progress is slow and requires a lot of grinding the same parts of the game over and over. There's also not that much content once you've gotten powerful enough to make it to the end, as there's no post-game content. 
So there you have it. That's every tale of Conan the Barbarian in video game form. If you want a deep, rich dive into the world of Conan, then Age of Conan is definitely the game you'll want to be playing, as it has so many of the characters and locations from the original stories. Although being an MMORPG, it might not be for everyone. For standalone experiences, I think the 2002 Conan game is pretty good, even if the combat is a bit loose. And Conan the Sumerian captures the feel of an old school adventure, even if the combat is lacking, again. While none of the games are connected in any way, I think this actually reflects the original stories of Robert E. Howard pretty well. Each story is a standalone adventure, reminiscent of the tall tales told in communities and local legends, and you never know what is real and what is embellished to make a good story. And as the stories of Conan the Barbarian approach entering the public domain, maybe we'll see more of these stories being told as the adventures of our favourite barbarian continue. Thanks for watching this video game Odyssey 4, Conan the Barbarian. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel, it really helps. You can also check out my Twitch channel, where the full playthroughs of each of the games featured in this video are kept. You can also support the channel on Patreon for as little as £1 per month. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you for the next video game Odyssey.